Good evening, everyone. Nice to see such a, a big crowd here, uh, but it's also going to be a very good event, so uh, thank you all very much for coming. Now, approximately uh, 10 years ago, my uh, chief economist, Steen Jacobsen, uh, came home. I think it was from summer holiday, actually, and he uh, threw a battered paper bag at me and said, uh, Lars, you've got to read this book. It's actually a little bit more than 10 years, to be honest, but... Uh, but uh, he, he threw this book at me, and I don't know if you've seen the American uh, uh, paperback version of, of Atlas Rock. We have to be highly motivated to read it because it's really, really difficult, very thin uh, and small pages and letters. So, uh, so even then, it took me a little while to convince myself. But then again, I normally take Steen's recommendations. So, uh, so I read the book, uh, and uh, I must say I was uh, extremely... Uh, taken with with atlas rock right from from that time because uh, i think it uh, in many ways quantified uh, very much ideas and feelings that i i had about uh, capitalism and politics and how the world worked and, and and here for the first time although it didn't hugely change my mind on on this uh, for the first time i understood with 100 percent certainty that i'd been right all the time and of course, that's very nice to have the, the foundation for, for your views explained. At the time, Ayn Rand was not unknown, but she was very little known in, in Denmark. Uh, Kim Fournay, that my partner here in Saxo Bank, uh, was also very fascinated with the book. Uh, and we decided back then to publish in 2003, I believe it was, we, uh, we published 10,000 copies of the, of the US version. Dis distributed it to to anybody we could think of, members of parliament, uh, mayors, political commentators, journalists, and of course a lot of people that we thought would be interested. Uh, and over the years, we have we've actually had to reprint it a couple of times. So by now, we uh, we have also uh, uh, done a Danish version, which is over there. Uh, it's not enough for everyone, but I know some of you have it already. So uh, please don't uh, don't be a hog here. If you have it already, let somebody else have a copy. Yeah? Um, so we sent it out to all these people. Uh, I'm not too sure if they if they all read it. There hasn't been uh, much proof that they understood the message, or perhaps uh, perhaps they misunderstood it and thought it was a blueprint for how to run society. But uh, but uh, at least we, we gave them a chance. Uh, I can remember one time being quite pleased because I, I saw a, a live TV interview with Holger K. Nielsen, and, and right behind his head was a copy of of Verden Skelved. So that was uh, at least some success, but I'm not sure that he read it either. Now, the book is increasingly relevant, I think. Uh, it is almost prophetic, uh, as, you, uh, as you will know if you read it. Uh, I like to say that when, I, when we first started passing it out, that we were sort of in Denmark, probably reached around page 300 in this massive book. But unfortunately, I think we progressed to at least, at least uh, page seven or 800. And really, it's just uh, a question of, of not getting to the end of this book. But, but there's uh, so many things that is being predicted in Atlas Rock that, that actually is coming true, not least in the financial crisis where it has been uh, you know, significantly accelerated. I, I still think Atlas Rock is the best description of uh, of what happens when when a society collapses under its weight of socialism and 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 uh, statism and government involvement. Uh, and and uh, it is really frightening to to see how accurate many of these descriptions have been. And and uh, unfortunately, there's no real reason to suspect that. Uh, that Ms. Rand should not be right about the rest of her analysis because it's really about the dynamics imp 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 implicit in, in, in a society of that nature. I've uh, been good friends with Iran for a long time, uh, since we, we started speaking in connection with the first version of, of uh, publishing the book uh, back in, in, in the early 2000s. Um, Yaron uh, is a is a very uh, uh, well known speaker on on the subject of Ayn Rand, uh, commentator. He's authored his own books, which you 
uh, will see that we have we have given you a copy of his his brand new book, The Free Market Revolution. Uh, and I can really think of nobody better to uh, to talk a little bit about uh, why capitalism actually works in spite of all the bad press it gets at the moment and how free markets work. Uh, so I would like you to uh, to welcome Yaron and uh, pass over the the mic to you. Thank you very much for coming, Yaron. Thank you, Lars. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Now I'm going to take it that most of this audience is kind of pro-capitalist, pro-free markets. I see people nodding. I didn't know there were this many in Europe. <laughs> so uh, I'm inspired. We're off to a good start. All of us who are, are supportive of free markets, all of us who are supportive of capitalism, really need to start asking ourselves a really fundamental question. And that question is, why are we losing? Because we are losing the debate. We are losing the battle. Uh, statism is growing all around us. I come from the United States where over the last 30 years we have lost over and over and over again. And, and this isn't a political issue in my view. This isn't a democratic versus republican issue. Uh, you know, George Bush was no friend of capitalism and free markets. Not when you really understand what he did and you actually look at the policies. I'd even argue that we've been losing in the United States and in Europe for a hundred years. For a hundred years, government has only grown. Regulations have only increased. Redistribution of wealth has only intensified. There's been no momentum in the other direction. Even the so-called Reagan revolution in the United States was very short-lived, probably around six years. And government spending, government spending is always a good proxy for the level of government involvement in the economy. Government spending under Ronald Reagan doubled in his eight years in office. Now the reason he's considered a friend of the markets is because the previous eight years it had tripled. So he slowed the rate of growth. But it's still true that from a purely economic perspective, one could argue that the state had grown under Reagan and that economic freedom actually in the long term had shrunk. So we have been losing this battle for 100 years. Republicans, Democrats, in America at least, it hasn't mattered. There have been small victories here and there, the Thatcher Revolution, Ronald Reagan for a while, but in the overall picture, we've lost. And we really need to ask the question of why? Because we shouldn't be losing. And the reason we shouldn't be losing is because we're right. We have truth on our side. And I think the truth is pretty self-evident. I don't think it's that hard. Capitalism works. Free markets create economic wealth. The standard of living of people in relatively, in free markets, relative to non-free markets, there's no comparison. And the freer you make a market, the higher the standard of living. This is an empirical truth, and it's not an empirical truth that is hidden from us. It is an empirical truth that stares us in the face. If you travel around the world, you see it. You see countries that have engaged in economic freedom succeed to the extent that they engage in that economic freedom. Countries that don't stay poor. If the standard of value is standard of living, if the standard of value is wealth creation, then capitalism has won. It's unequivocal. You know, we've got, for the last 200 years, we've been running an economic experiment. We tried all kinds of various economic systems. We've tried all kinds of models. And the conclusion should be obvious. You know, we tried 
the extreme form of socialism, right? We tried communism. We know, we know it doesn't work. It results in tens of millions of people dying in the standard of living being really, really low. We've tried, I wouldn't say the extreme form of capitalism, but close. And what was the result? When the United States and Europe experimented with free markets in the 19th century and early part of the 20th century. <laughs> well, an explosion of economic growth, the creation of a middle class, the tripling of European population, the standard of living going through the roof, unimaginable. The difference in standard of living between 1750 and 1910. I mean, it, it's just unimaginable, that difference. And what caused that? The Industrial Revolution, what caused it is capitalism. What caused it are markets. You now, America is a great example. Uh, 1776, when America was founded, it was a second, maybe third-rate colony of the United Kingdom. Right? The reason the Americans won the War of Independence, I tell my American friends to their dismay, is not because they were that good, but because England didn't care that much. They were worried about real wars with France and Spain, you know, real powers, right? But by 1914, the United States was the strongest military and industrial power in the world. Now, what happened in those 140 years? Uh, uh, magic? Miracle? Socialism? Statism? No. You got the country that was most free where capitalism flourished, and it went from a third-ranked colony to the mightiest industrial power in human history. That's the power of capitalism. That's the power of freedom. And yet we reject it. Now, not only have we done an experiment across time, and by the way, we've experimented with all the different variations, right? A little bit of socialism, more freedom, more socialism, less freedom. And again, the statistics all line up. You get, you get this nice correlation between economic freedom and wealth creation. Economic freedom, standard of living. Asia's figured this out, right? This is why they've moved towards economic freedom. And what's the result? Hundreds of millions of people rising up from poverty. This is a system we all hate, right? A system that allows the poor to rise to, from poverty to be middle class. Starvation disappears, right? The biggest beneficiaries of capitalism throughout human history have been the poor. It's unequivocal. So we've run an experiment across time. But we also run it across geographies, right? Asia is a good example. In spite of the fact that the financial crisis has been blamed on capitalism, this financial crisis, in every aspect of it, was caused from beginning to end by government policy from beginning to end, and the more you delve into it, the more you understand what actually happened, the more you dig down, you find government policies, you find regulations, you find government controls that incentivize bad behavior, that cause bad behavior, that necessitated bad behavior. And yet, who do we blame? <laughs> capitalism. So, what's going on here, right? We've got empirical evidence that suggests that capitalism works, that it's good, that it produces standard of living. And we've got a reality where we are moving away from it, we're rejecting it, we're increasing the size of government, increasing the size of regulations, increasing the size of redistribution. Yeah. How does this, how do, we, how do we make this fit? Every time there's a crisis, we blame it on bankers, we blame it on the markets, you know, on free markets. You know, this is part of the joke, right? People blame free markets for the, for, for, for the financial crisis, right? Because we all know that in 2007, we had free markets in America. And the funny thing is that they, they, they blame it on free markets in banking. Banking in the United States is the most regulated industry in the country. No business is more regulated than banking. What free market? Free market in mortgages? The biggest buyer of mortgages were Freddie and Fannie, government entities. What free market in mortgages? Free market in home building? All of these industries are the most regulated businesses. It's no surprise 
that when the crisis happened, it happens in the most regulated, controlled businesses, not in the free ones. Doesn't matter. We still blame it on markets, right? We blame the Great Depression on Wall Street. Now, no serious economist today believes the Great Depression was caused by Wall Street. No. Paul Krugman doesn't count as a serious economist. <laughs> and even Paul Krugman knows that it wasn't caused by the Great Depression, by, by Wall Street. We all get it. It was caused, you know, the science is in. It was caused by the Federal Reserve. It was caused by bad government policies. There's a whole string of reasons. But it wasn't caused by business. They responded to the incentives created by government. Doesn't matter. We still teach in our high schools, in our colleges, that it was caused by the Great, Depre by, by the Great Depression, was caused by business. So something is going on here. There's something deep down inside of us that rejects capitalism, that rejects free markets, and that is willing to evade, to ignore, to be blind to reality in our attempts to fight against capitalism. We're willing to ignore history. We're willing to ignore Hong Kong. We're willing to ignore success. We're willing to ignore the real causes of the financial crisis in our quest to reject free markets, to reject capitalism. And the question has to be asked, why? What is it about this system? What is it about free markets? What is it about capitalism that we so despise, that we instinctually, instinctually in our culture, we rebel against it? Well, what is capitalism about? What are free markets about? What do people go into the marketplace to do? Why do we participate in the marketplace? Why does Steve Jobs build one of these? It's an iPhone. Why does he build one of these? To make money. Right? Has the first one of these uh, had a profit margin of 60%. Steve Jobs wanted to make money, make a profit. Now, it wasn't just about money, granted, right? What else about Steve Jobs wanted to create this? He had a passion for this. He had a passion for beautiful things that he wanted, that he imagined and he wanted to see out there in the world. But this iPhone is about whom? The creation of this iPhone is about whom? It's about Steve Jobs. Did Steve Jobs care about me? Not really. Care about you? Not really. You're in many ways a means to an end. The end was his profit, his vision. This is about Steve Jobs. Business is there to make money, to make a profit. Business is there for themselves, their own self-interest. Business is about self-interest. Now, in 2008, you know, the economy was in the U.S. was spiraling out of control, really declining. And I went to the mall to buy one of these, right, because I wanted to help stimulate the U.S. economy. <laughs> because I know that's why you guys go shopping, right? It's to help your fellow man. You want to make sure that there are jobs out there in the retail stores and that people have, right? Right? No? Why do you go shopping? Why do you buy an iPhone? Why do you go to the mall? For whose interests? To maximize social utility? To benefit your fellow man? No, you go to the mall for your self-interest. Because you believe that the iPhone will make you more productive, because it's cool, because you want to play with it. You go buy nice clothes because you want to look good. Both on the production side and on the consumption side, markets are about self-interest. They're about people pursuing their own self-interest. That's what markets are about. We can pretend otherwise. We can write about the social utility of whatever. But the bottom, at the end of the day, that's what they're about. And, and this is not a new observation. Adam Smith tells us this in The Wealth of Nations. 
He says the baker bakes the bread, not because he loves us, not because he cares about us, but because he needs to make a living for himself. He needs to feed his family. He's trying, and he loves baking bread. It's fun for him, right? Hopefully. But the fundamental is it's about the baker. And the delivery guy who takes the baked goods to the grocery store is not doing it out of a sense of helping his fellow man. He's doing it because he's trying to take care of his own family. He's trying to take care of himself. He's trying to make a living. Everybody in the marketplace is there for their own self-interest. That is the essence of capitalism. It is the essence of markets. Again, people pretend otherwise, but let's be honest, because everybody knows this. Everybody knows it. It's about self-interest. But what have we been taught about self-interest? What have we been taught from when we were this big about pursuing your self-interest? Now, I know what I was taught. You know, I grew up in a, in, a, in a good Jewish family, and my mother taught me that to be moral, to be good, to be just, to be noble, means putting your interests last, not first. It means being selfless, not selfish. It means placing the well-being of others ahead of you. Now, she didn't mean it, right? <laughs> Not really. But that's how we position our moral ideal. To be noble, to be good, to be virtuous is to sacrifice. Not to pursue your own self-interest. And what is a sacrifice? Well, before we get to sacrifice, when I bought the iPhone, who lost? Who was worse off for me buying the iPhone? Did Apple lose? No, they made a profit. Did I lose? No, because I'm better off, right? I paid $300 for this thing, and I got something worth more than $300 to me. Apple sold me this for $300, and they got something worth more than this to them. They made a profit. Trade is win-win. I win, Apple wins. What is a sacrifice? I give and what do I expect to get in return? What do I expect to get in return? Less or nothing. The whole point of a sacrifice is lose, win. The whole point, otherwise we wouldn't call it a sacrifice, we'd call it a trade. Trade is win-win, sacrifice, lose, win. But note that our ethics, our moral code tells us that lose, win is noble and good and just, and win, win, eh. Not really that valuable from a moral perspective. Right? Think of it this way. When Bill Gates built Microsoft, right, made for himself tens of billions of dollars, how did he do it? He sold us all products. He sold us all products. And how much did we benefit from those products? They maybe cost 100 bucks, right? How much did we benefit from them? Well, I mean, if you actually did the math in your head, you would realize that you have gained much more than 100 bucks, $100 from every one of Microsoft's products. It's probably in the tens of thousands, if not in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, the value that you got. Bill Gates, Microsoft, touched every person on the planet. They have increased the standard of living of everyone making us more efficient, making us more productive, the ability to communicate by standardizing a platform. You could go on and on. He benefited all of humanity and made for himself tens of billions of dollars in the process. What kind of moral credit did we give Bill Gates for helping all of us? Zero to negative. When we think Again, not as a business leader. As a business leader, we all admire him, right? He was a success. But as a moral person, from a perspective of ethics, what do we think of Bill Gates? Eh. Negative, or at best, neutral. What's ethical about that? He was making money. Now, when does Bill Gates become a good guy? When did Bill Gates become a good guy? When he left Microsoft, so he was no longer benefiting, and he started giving his money away. 
when he became a philanthropist. Then, now that's small. Oh, he's helping people. Now, I will guarantee to you, I guarantee we can do the math, that Bill Gates will affect and help more people with his works on Microsoft than he will ever do through charity. By probably a factor of 100 or 1,000. There's no comparison. He will impact more people in a positive way through Microsoft than he ever will through his charity. Yet his charitable work gets more credit. His economic work, his business work, gets no moral credit because he benefited from it. Because self-interest, we are taught, is what? It's tainted. It's not moral. So if you benefit from the work you do, you can't claim moral credit. We've been taught that by all our religious and secular leaders forever. If you benefit from something, you don't get moral credit. So here's the, here's the distorted world we live in. This is a world in which capitalism cannot survive. Making stuff building stuff, creating stuff. From an ethical perspective, not so good. Giving it away, yes, that's great. Now, how do you give away stuff you haven't created? That's a separate question, right? <laughs> now, how do we make Bill Gates a saint? Right, he's a good guy now, but I think I figured out how he could become a saint. Right, I haven't talked to the Pope, so I can't guarantee this. What would, have, what would he have to do to, to become from an, again, we would all kind of make fun of him, but at the same time, we would all admire him morally. What would he have to do? He'd have to give it all away. And that wouldn't be enough. He'd have to move into a tent. And if he could show some suffering, some, you know, blood would be good. <laughs> then we'd say, wow, what a great person. I don't want to be that person, but what a great person. Right? That is the ethical world we live in. We live a world in which we believe that suffering, sacrifice, giving is noble and good and virtuous and everything. And again, creating, building is bad. Even though, even though, it's not even questionable the fact that the building and creating helps more people by far, than the giving. As I like to, again, use America as an example, it's not the case that between 1776 and 1914, America became an industrially mighty country because of charity. It didn't do it because it had great philanthropists. It did it because it had great businessmen. It did it because of the creators, the wealth creators. It did it because business. It did it because a self-interest. It did because people went out there to pursue their own self-interest. It's why people even emigrated to America. Why did they go there? To make their lives better. Why did people go to Hong Kong? To make their lives better. It's all about self-interest. And yet we condemn self-interest. We reject self-interest. Ethically, we view it as evil, as wrong. Right? And what we view as good is helping and giving charity. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But are they the essence of virtue? Are they really what make good good? If that's the case, then socialism is the system for us. Because socialism is not about building, creating, making. It's about giving, redistributing. It's about being charitable with other people's money, of course, but being charitable. Right? But note that it's so in my view, as long as we hold this view, as long as we hold this ethical view, socialism will always win. Statism will always win. Every financial crisis will be blamed on bankers and businessmen. Why? Because they're self-interested. Self-interest leads to what? what? So, you know, this is the trick, right? On the one hand, they tell us, be selfless. Sacrifice, that's good and that's noble. Nobody, but nobody really wants to be that. So you have to make the alternative very unattractive. So what are we told self-interest is really about? Does anybody say self-interest is about creating and building and making something? No. What are we told self-interest is about? When we point to the kid in the schoolyard and say, see that kid over there? He's selfish. Do we mean he's a builder and a creator and a 
taking care of his own life and making it? No. What are we, what, what, what are we saying when you call somebody selfish? We're saying he's a lying, cheating SOB. SOB. Son of a bitch, right? Right? A really bad person. Because we've associated in our minds now, we've been taught by the same people who teach us the virtue of selflessness, that being self-interested means being a liar, being a cheater. The model for this is Bernie Madoff. Right? Bernie Madoff, that's self-interest. Who wants to be Bernie Madoff? Nobody. So this is all we've got, is this other morality, is being selfless. Now, was Bernie Madoff self-interested? Did Bernie Madoff take care of himself? Did he pursue the kind of things that made his life the best life that it could be? Yeah, I see people nodding. Really? You really think that, huh? Didn't work out too well for Bernie. How many people in this room have ever lied? Don't. <laughs> it doesn't work. If what you really want is your own happiness, if what you really want is success in life, if what you really want is your self-interest, self-interest, I dare you to find me a way of how to lie and achieve that. Liars get caught. Not good. <laughs> jail, business people who won't do business with you, spouses who leave you, kids who won't talk to you. Lying does not work. It's not a good strategy for self-interest. <coughs> Turns out that lying is quite, what's the opposite of self-interest? It's quite self-destructive. You know, Bernie Madoff claims that he's happier now in jail than he was before he was caught. And I believe him. Because think about the times you have lied Multiply that by 100, which is Bernie Madoff's life, because he lied all the time. He had to. There was no way for him to sustain it. Think about lying to your best friends. Think about lying to your family. And think about what that does to you, to your ability to function, to your ability to live. Lying, cheating, and stealing are not self-interest. But if we believe they are, so think about this. Try to hold this, right? Lying, stealing, cheating, that's what self-interest means. Capitalism equals self-interest. Capitalism equals lying, cheating, and stealing. So when there's a financial crisis, when there's an economic crisis, who do we blame? Well, the lying, cheating, and stealing guys, the capitalists. It's obvious. And we want to, what do we want to do? How do we control the lying, and cheating, and stealing? Because if we leave them alone, right, if we let the free market work, they'd all lie, steal, and cheat. So how do we control them? What do we call those controls? Regulations. The whole regulatory state is there to catch, control, regulate the lying, stealing, and cheating that we know will happen if we left them alone. You know, I, I don't know if it exists here, but in the United States, when you walk into an elevator, every elevator in the United States you walk into, there's a little diploma on the wall that says that a government bureaucrat has certified that the elevator won't fall, <laughs> that it won't kill you. Why do we need that? We need that because we're convinced that in a free market, without government regulations, elevator builders would build elevators that killed people. Because that's how you make money, by killing your customers. <laughs> but we really believe this. If we didn't have food inspectors, McDonald's would poison all of us. <laughs> that is the rationale. Why? Because they're self-interested, and self-interest leads to lying, stealing, and cheating, poisoning. Destroying your customers. It's insanity when you say it out loud, but it's in everybody's subconscious. It's what we as a culture believe. We believe businessmen will always lie, steal, and cheat because we associate that with self-interest. I was on, in 2002, you remember the Enron and WorldCom, you remember all those scandals? These were bad businessmen who committed crimes, right? About five, six of them, high profile all in very regulated industries, I would just mention, right? All in the telecom industries, all who were very involved in politics, all of them, which is just an interesting side note. But there was a law passed, there's a consequence of that. It was called Sarbanes-Oxley. Now, you know, put aside your knowledge of Sarbanes-Oxley. This is a, a, a regulation basically 
has government monitor all of your counting numbers. You, you know, it, it, it's very, very burdensome accounting regulation for internal controls within a company. That's why Saxo probably won't open offices in the United States because it's a disaster to do all this, right? Why was this passed? I mean, there were some crooks. They were caught. They should go to jail. End of story. But no, the assumption was we just happened to catch these five. They're all crooks. And what we need to do is have a mechanism to catch them. And we'll do Sarbanes-Oxley. By the way, how many people have been caught by Sarbanes-Oxley as committing fraud? Zero. Did it prevent the financial crisis? No. But nobody's going to do away with it. It's there for good. I was on, you know Bill O'Reilly? The crazy American talk show guy. Um, I was on a show just after Enron and all these things were happening in the, fall, in the uh, spring of 2002. And Bill O'Reilly was on a campaign to fire every CEO in America because he said they're all crooks. Where does that come from? This notion that if you're self-interested, if you're in business, you're self-interested, and if you're self-interested, you're lying, cheating, stealing. And that's how we get the regulatory state. That's why we regulate business. That's why you want to control them. So that's one piece of statism. The other piece of statism is the entitlement state. Now, this one's easy. Why do we have an entitlement state if we believe in an ethic of selflessness? Well, because an ethic of selflessness tells you that your moral duty, your moral responsibility from when you're born is to help people in need. And since you don't do it well enough in a free market, since there's never enough charity to fulfill everybody's need in a free market, we, the government, are going to step in and help you be better people. Because you know what? On a day-to-day -day life, you're just too self-interested to help the people over there who need your money. They need health care. They need food. They need something. iPhones these days. And you're just too focused on your own life to help them out. So we're going to increase your taxes a little bit, take some money from you and give it to them. Look, they're old and poor, or they're young and poor. It doesn't matter. They tug at our heartstrings, right? You know, and people say, people vote their economic interests. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. In America, in this last election, of the 10 wealthiest counties in the United States, how many do you think voted for Obama? Now, understand that voting for Obama meant, if you were wealthy, that your taxes were going to go up. So by voting for Obama, you voted to have your taxes go up. Of the 10 wealthiest counties, how many went for Obama? You're more pessimistic than I am. Eight. Eight. Wealthy people voted to increase their taxes because they think it's right. They think it's just. We should be helping those people over there. How are they going to help themselves? They need stuff. We were taught from when we were this big, again, that we need to help those in need. So the government's just helping us out. It's just facilitating the wealth transfer that we should be engaged in voluntarily anyway. And we're suckers for it. We can't complain. And there's another element that they use here, right? Businessmen live this self-interested life. They're about profit. They're about their vision. They're about having fun, enjoying their work, being productive. But what does it mean to be a moral hero? We said it's about giving. It's about who's, who's the name that pops into mind when you think about morality, right? Mother Teresa. So we're living over here in the, in the physical, material world of self-interest. But the moral ideal is Mother Teresa. Now, we don't actually want to be Mother Teresa. But that's what morality is. And we're not living up to it. What does that cause? What emotion does that cause? When you should be doing something, but you're doing something different. It starts with a G. Guilt. Now, guilt is the mechanism that, you know, philosophers religious leaders and politicians have used forever to get us to do stuff we don't want to do. And this is a beautiful setup for guilt. This is perfect. Get those selfish businessmen. They're not going to vote to lower their taxes. They're going to vote to increase their taxes because it'll make them feel less guilty. And it works because they do. 
You go and, you know, I was at a, uh, an awards dinner uh, in, uh, in uh, South Carolina. It's a very conservative place. This isn't about, even about conservative and, and leftist in, in America. South Carolina, awards dinner for uh, Lifetime Achievement Award to business leaders, right? There was, I think, eight of them. And they read these long bios for each business leader. Ten-minute bios. Nine minutes, well, let me say it the other way around. One minute on their business success. One minute on their business success. Nine minutes on their community service and charity. I mean, that's insane. And, and the business leaders were fine with it because the one minute they feel guilty about. The nine minutes is to make up for the guilt. It's to make up for the guilt. So the fact that they built a business, that they employed people, that they created a service or product that everybody benefited in the community from, that is worth nothing. It's the charity that they give. That's what makes them good people. This is insanity, but this is the world we live in. And the reason is, the reason is, is our perception of self-interest and that nobody, nobody out there is willing to defend it. And this is Rand, Ayn Rand's real contribution to this debate, in my view. And she rejects this whole moral code. She rejects the notion that you need to be selfless. She rejects the notion that sacrifice is what nobility is about. That selflessness is, about, is what morality is about. She rejects 2,000 years of moral teachings. And she returns, in a sense, to an Aristotelian vision of morality. The vision of morality that says that, no, morality is the science that studies how to perfect our own lives for the achievement of our own happiness. Morality is about self-interest. It's about living the best life that you can live. It's about making the most of the one life you have on this earth. It's about achieving your own personal values, about making yourself the best that you can make yourself, living what Aristotle called a, a life, a flourishing life. Eudaimonia in Greek, right? Interpreted as flourishing or happy, but a fulfilling, flourishing, full life as a human being with all the capacities that you're capable of as a human being. That is not a Bernie Madoff life. That is not a life of lying, cheating, and stealing. It's a life of building and creating and exercising your mind. A life of rationally pursuing the values that make your life possible. And it's not just any values. It's not about, you know, the whim of the moment. That's Bernie Madoff, his whims. It's not that he sat down. Bernie didn't sit down one day and say, huh, I want to make a lot of money. I know. After lots of thought, I know. I'll steal my best friend's money. That's the best way to achieve a fulfilling, flourishing, successful life. No, that's not what Bernie Madoff did. Bernie Madoff saw a pile of money, and he felt like he wanted it. He desired it, so he took it. I can guarantee very little thought went into the decision to take it. Because if he had thought what would make me a really good life, that isn't what he would have chosen. Pyramid schemes, even a... Young man can understand pyramid schemes don't work. <laughs> they lead to failure. So what Rand is defining is a new morality. A morality built around the idea of making your life the best life that it can be. A morality based on the values necessary for that. And you see those values, by the way, if you walk around the building here, you see the values on the wall. Because what is necessary for an individual to be successful. What is necessary for all the values that we have, all the values that we as human beings have achieved, all the good that we have achieved in the world, where does it come from? How have we as a species survived? How have we flourished? What has made all of that possible? This is what we should look to find the kind of values that a true pursuit of self-interest will lead to. Because you know, as a species, we're not that great. If you look at your neighbor, you can see that. <laughs> That's a joke. 
We're pretty weak. We're slow. We don't have claws. We don't have fangs. In the physical world of survival, we are pretty pathetic. We would not have survived if not for what? If not for our minds, if not for reason. Reason is where we get our values. Reason is how we attain stuff. Reason is how we figured out how to create agriculture, how to hunt, how to build buildings, how to create computers. Everything that we have out there is at the end of the day a product of the rational mind. So if that's true, what does it mean to be self-interested? It means to pursue reason. It means to be rational. It means to think. It needs to figure out the problems that we faced. It doesn't mean just to emote. It doesn't mean to do what you feel like doing. It means to figure out what's good for me and to pursue that. That's what self-interest really means. It's an objective standard of reality, of the rational mind, in choosing one's values and in how to pursue them. So think about a morality that says that each one of us our moral responsibility is not to help others. Helping others is fine, but that's not the essence of the morality. But the essence of morality is pursuing our own happiness. The essence of morality is making our lives the best life that it can be. And that to do that, we have to pursue rationality, that we have to think, that we have to pursue rational values that will truly, rationally make our lives the best lives that it can be. What kind of political system does a person who holds that morality want to pursue? What kind of political system is consistent with that kind of individualism, if you will? That's capitalism. That says that Bill Gates is moral. Bill Gates is a good guy. Bill Gates is close to a saint because he made $40 billion for himself. Because the only way he could have created 40 billion is by creating something and then trading that something with other people. It's because he made his life better. He had to work at it. He had to exercise his mind. He had to be rational in his business dealings. That's what made him a good guy. And hey, by the way, he helped lots of people at the same time because that's how you make money. You make money by helping other people. But the reason he's good is because he took care of himself. He made good choices about his own life, I hope, right? I don't know him that well. But at least in his business life, we can say he's virtuous. Indeed, I would argue that making money in a free market, the market today, a lot of the money's made through cronyism, but in a free market, making money is a sign of virtue. It's a sign of virtue because it's a sign that you're a trader, that you're not exploiting others, that you're not allowing others to exploit you, that you're trading value for value, and that you're taking care of yourself. You're taking care of your own life. Now imagine a world in which we view businessmen as heroes. The world of Atlas Shrugged, the heroes at least in Atlas Shrugged, right? They view each other as heroes. Ayn Rand views them, them as heroes. They are the good guys. They're the good guys because they make and create and build stuff. Can they be charitable? Sure, but is that the essence? That's not the essence of virtue. The essence of virtue is the building and creating because the essence of virtue is self-interest, not self-sacrifice, not being selfless. So in my view, we are losing today because we've lost the moral ethical battle. Indeed, we're not even fighting that battle. Ayn Rand is the only voice who fights that battle. We're losing the battle because we're stuck in economic arguments where nobody cares about economic arguments. If they think that businessmen and capitalism is immoral, they will vote against it no matter what the economic consequences are. People do not vote their pocketbook. They vote virtue. They want to be good. They want to think of themselves as good. So they'll vote for the politicians. And, and Obama knows this because Obama in his speeches always talked about fairness justice. He didn't talk about eco the economy because he had nothing to talk about. Right? <laughs> but he talked about fairness and justice. And they've already changed the way we think about fairness and justice. What does fairness mean? 
Equality. Never used to mean that. In the old days, fairness meant what? Getting what you deserve. That's what fairness used to mean. Justice used to mean treating people the way they deserve. Today it means treating people the same. That's not justice. But they've changed the way we think about the world. Changed the language. This morality has corrupted how we talk. So we are playing on their ethical, they've, they've got the ethical high ground. We're playing on their home advantage. What happens when you play in sports on somebody else's, when somebody else has a home advantage? They m win most of the time. If we play on their moral ground, they win. And the morality of selflessness is consistent with socialism. If we play to the morality of selflessness, we will get socialism. The only way to win is to flip it on them. It's to change the terms of the debate. What is necessary today to achieve a free market, what is necessary is a revolution. But it's not an economic revolution. We won the economic arguments a long time ago, a long time ago. We won them in the playing field of reality, and we won them in the playing field of theory. We've got the Hayek's and the Mises and the Friedman's. We know the theory, we know it works, and we know in reality it works. Where we've lost is in the playing field of morality. So the revolution is not an economic revolution. The revolution is a moral revolution. What we need is to be able to defend capitalism from a moral, ethical perspective. We need to be able to defend the profit motive. We need to be able to defend self-interest. And if we can do that, we win. Because no person engaged in his own self-interest wants the government paternalistic mother on his shoulder telling him what he can and cannot eat, what elevator he can and cannot walk into, what he can and cannot do, and how he should use his money. No, if you're after pursuit of your own self-interest, you want freedom. You want to be left alone. You want to be going out there and try stuff. You might fail. But you learn from failure and you rise up. And if you don't learn from failure, whose problem is that? Yours, not mine. So if we could convince people of an ethic of self-interest, the argument for capitalism is trivial. It's just an argument to free themselves up. And indeed, if you think about the founding of America, which I think still symbolizes what freedom should mean and can mean, it was founded not on economic principles, but on principles of political freedom grounded in principles of individualism. The most important political document, in my view, in human history is the Declaration of Independence, the American Declaration of Independence of 1776. Because in it, they articulate a universal truth that each one of us has an inalienable right. Inalienable, by the way, means nobody can take it away from you, not even a majority. Nobody. Each one of us has an inalienable right to what? To pursue the common good? To bring about the common interest, to maximize social utility? No. They understood that the fundamental right is the pursuit of your own life. Your own life, which means what? What does a right to life mean? It means the right to be free, to make the decisions that you believe are necessary for your life. That nobody can coerce you into doing otherwise. That's what a right to your life means. That nobody can force you to do what you don't want to do. That's what a right to liberty means. And the spirit that we really need to capture, if we're going to win the battle for capitalism, the spirit that we need to capture is the spirit of an inalienable right, an inalienable right to the most selfish political statement in human history, an inalienable right to pursue happiness. Your happiness. The individual's happiness. If we can capture that spirit, the spirit of the pursuit of happiness, with a moral code that justifies it, then, and only then, can we win. Thank you all.
So I'm going to assume that there are going to be some people who want to challenge me. Well, at the very least, ask me some questions. So there has to be a first. Yes? So to what extent is it uh, moral to cheat in taxes? <laughs> so to what, um, to what extent is it moral to cheat in your taxes? I don't think there's anybody from the IRS here, although <laughs> it is on video. Look, this is, it's a question of you have to think through what is your self-interest. There's a heavy price to be paid if you're caught, so that has to factor heavily. Uh, but in my view, at the end of the day, taxes are theft. You know, it's, it's an interesting <laughs> step. Think about this. Your neighbor wants, uh, you know, is, is going through hard times. He doesn't have enough money to feed his family, let's say. He has only two options in life. He can come to you and ask you for your help. And if the neighbor's a nice guy, we would probably help him, right? If we had the money and if our kids were well-fed and everything, we would help him. That's one option. The second option is he can pull out a gun and steal our money. But those are the only two options. Now, we pretend that by getting all of us into a room and voting to take my money, right, then it's okay. Then it's not stealing anymore. So that's what happens, right? The neighbor goes to the community and he says, that guy has a lot of money. I need money. Could you help me get his money for me? Right? Now, if he, used, if he used the Sicilian mafia to do that, we would say that's bad. But we call it government, and we say that's good, right? Because it's democracy and a majority decided. But remember inalienable right? Inalienable? You can't take it away from you, not even by majority rule? You have an inalienable right to your life, or your life, your property is part of your life. Nobody has a right to take it away from you. So, to the extent that you can work to protect your money, your savings, and not go to jail, go for it. <laughs> well, democracy is a tricky word. Um, Depends what we mean by democracy, because we mean different things. If we mean by democracy, majority rule, majority gets to vote on everything, then you can never have freedom under democracy, if that's what we mean by democracy. Remember Socrates, the great Greek philosopher? So Socrates is walking around Athens, and uh, he argues with young people, and he's, he's talking, he's, he's debating religion with them. And the elders of Athens go, wait a minute, he's corrupting our youth. This is no good. So they get together and they say, what are we going to do about Socrates? We need to silence him. And they very quickly come to the conclusion that there's only one way to silence Socrates. And that's to kill him. So they vote. And 51% or 60% or 70%, who knows what the number is, vote to kill Socrates. So they give him a chalice of poison and he drinks it. And, you know... One story is that Plato says to Socrates, Plato's a student, and says to Socrates, hey, Socrates, we can escape, there's a tunnel. And Socrates says, no, democracy has spoken, and he drinks the poison, right? That's democracy. There's no free speech in democracy. It's whatever the majority wants. If the majority wants you to be able to speak, then you speak. If they don't want you to speak, then you don't speak. That is inconsistent with freedom. The American system which is flawed, but is as close as we've come to, I think, a free system, is not a democratic system. It has voting in it. But you only vote, to read in, it's in the original intent, over insignificant things. The important stuff, like free speech, you don't vote on. It doesn't matter if 99.9% .9 of Americans don't like what I have to say. Turns out I have a right to say it, and nobody can stop me. That's not a democracy. That's, you know, a constitutional republic or you can, you know, and I, I don't, I think that you need to move to that kind of a system. You need to articulate politically. 
What are the rights of the individual? The right to life, liberty, property, and pursuit of happiness. Which means that a majority can't take your stuff. It's stealing. A majority can't tell you how to run your business. It's none of their business. A majority cannot intervene in your life. That's what freedom, what, when we talk about freedom, what do we mean? What do we mean by freedom? Freedom from what? Freedom from what? From oppression, that's extreme. What, what, is, a, what is a softer word, right? Freedom from force, from coercion, right? That's what we want. We want freedom from people forcing us to do things we don't want to do. So we need a political system that institutionalizes freedom from coercion. It institutionalizes, and we're pretty good at understanding that as an individual, I can't coerce you. I can't steal your money, right? I can't defraud you. We got that. But what the founders of America understood is what is the most coercive element in our society, in human history? What's the thing that coerced more people? and cause more suffering and more deaths and more murder and more destruction than any other force. Government. Well, and church, that's why they separated the two and try to control both, right? So how do we, if we want freedom, what do we need to do? We need to constrain government. And how do we constrain government? By empowering the individual, by recognizing his right to his life. That is the fundamental political principle. The fundamental political principle of freedom is individual rights. It's the right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the fundamental. And if you don't fight for that, you, don't, you, you can't win, and, and you, you create political systems that violate those rights and therefore are unfree. Yeah. No. So isn't it anarchism is the question? No. And the reason is... Why do we hate coercion? What is it about coercion that, is, uh, that we reject? Well, think of it the flip side. What I've articulated here is that the thing we want in pursuit of our values is our ability to reason, our ability to think. What is it that really stops thinking, stops the ability of reason? If I pull a gun and put it in your back and say, from now on, Two plus two equals five. And if it's not, I'm going to kill you. Can you build a bridge? No. You can't really do anything. Your life is over. Your reasoning faculty is gone. Force is the anti-reason. Force is anti-life. Coercion is anti-everything. Right? What you want to be able to do in society is extract force out. That is the only role of government. The only role of government, this institution, is to extract force from society so that we can be left free. You can't have a marketplace in force. It's the opposite of a market. It's the counter market, the anti-market. So you need an institution, separate institution. Its whole responsibility is the monopoly over the use of force. And where you constrain it, so it only uses force to protect you. It only uses force to retaliate, to catch the crooks, but never uses force on you if you're innocent. And that's why you do need government. I believe government is a necessary good, not a necessary evil, but a necessary good to protect our rights. That's exactly what you need government for, to protect individual rights, to protect us from coercion from other individuals and from other governments who might want to invade us and steal our stuff. Yes, in the back. How do you make sure minimalist government doesn't grow into something monstrous? There are two things you need to do. One is you have to have a robust, explicit constitution. You have to create a government that is constrained to begin with, right? Uh, the United States did an okay job at that, and that's why it's done so well for 200 years. Uh, but it wasn't perfect. You could do a much better job writing a constitution than what the founders of America did. And you can be a lot more explicit about what you mean. But look, at the end of the day, no constitution can withstand people not agreeing with it. <laughs> the only way you can limit government and keep it limited is by convincing people that it's in their self-interest to have that. 
by convincing all of that, us that it's not in our self-interest to regulate and redistribute wealth and have our rights violated. It's not in anybody's true self-interest. I mean, my view is that the person who receives welfare, right, the person who receives the entitlement check is the victim, is the victim. Why are they the victim? Because they're being institutionalized into passivity. They're being institutionalized into poverty. They will never strive. They will never get a job. They will never be ambitious. They will never pursue real values, which means they will never be happy. They will never gain self-esteem. They will never be happy. And you see this in communities that have been institutionalized into poverty. You see it in the black community in America. So many of them are welfare recipients. The unemployment among young people is so high that they've given up on a job. They've given up on life. They've given up on life. Because you know what? Where do we get our self-esteem and our happiness from? In spite of, in spite of all our denials. Where do we actually, where do we spend most of our time? Where do we set the most ambitious goals? At work. At our careers. That's where you get your self-esteem. That's where you get your real passion. And there can be all kinds of work, right? But that's where you get it. And if you, if you deny people work, you deny them the ability to be happy and successful. You deny them to have eudaimonia. You deny them the ability to flourish as human beings. And it's not about the money. It's about knowing you can take care of yourself. Knowing you can feed your family and yourself. Knowing you're creating something, not just consuming it. That knowledge is where you get that self-esteem. It's where you get human happiness. And that's what we deny. When we have minimum wage, you know, one of my favorite topics, minimum wage, right? All minimum wage does is create unemployment. Among whom? Among the people who are least able. Among the poorest people. That's why you have, you know, uh, you know, 20 plus percent, 25 percent unemployment among teenagers in the United States. Why? Because of minimum wage. You know what? They can only produce six bucks and yet businesses are forced to pay them 10 bucks. So they never buy, never hire them. Now, if somebody doesn't get a job at six bucks, how are they ever going to learn a skill to be able to make 10, 20, 40, 100 bucks an hour? How are they ever going to advance in life? They are the victims of minimum wage. That's what we need to explain. And that has to be tinged with a morality because the morality says that happiness is your goal and here's the way to achieve happiness. You achieve happiness by working, by being rational. You're being denied that. You should be demonstrating in the streets to get rid of the welfare state because it's crippling you. That's the message we should be sending the recipients of the welfare state. Now, it's not an easy message, but it is the message. So this is the standard. You cannot have a right to somebody else's stuff. You cannot have a right. <laughs> Rights don't conflict. Rights don't, if ever you see a conflict, then you're defining rights wrong. All a right is is a freedom of action. So when you say I have a right to my life, it means I'm free to pursue the values necessary for my life as long as I don't violate the rights of others to pursue their life, right? That's it. That's all there is. Does that mean I get free food? No, because we understand that to get free food means I have to use coercion on somebody else to grow the food for me. I can't have a right to somebody else's stuff. I can only have a right to be free to pursue my own values. That's it. So it's a positive. It's an action. It's a freedom. It's not about stuff. It's not about services. It's not about vacation. It's not about health care. If you have a right to health care, it means doctors are slaves. Because if you have a right to health care, it means they have to give it to you. That's slavery. They are working for you. You don't have to pay them. By right, they have to give it to you. So that, that can't be right. So whenever, whenever you have a right to somebody else's time or money or things, you know it's not a right.
<laughs> big question, big philosophical question. They are based on uh, a, a particular type of moral code. They're based on a moral code that are articulated. They're based on the idea that the purpose of life is your own happiness, your pursuit of your rational values. And then the philosophical question is, well, when you interact with other people, how do we, how do we all get along, right? How do we all in a society pursue our own rational values? What is the, what is the correct, appropriate, pro-life, pro-happiness, pro-individual way in which we interact and work together? That's what rights are. Rights are that code that allows rational people to pursue their own happiness in a social context. That the application of Rand's rational self-interest morality to the realm of politics, of a, of a, of a, of a society. Right? So they come from philosophy. They come as a logical consequence of the, 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 the needs, the, the necessity of a moral code when it's applied in a political context. It doesn't come from God, it comes from our nature as human beings. What we need in order to thrive, what we need is to be free, that's what we need. Rights are just a form of codifying those freedoms. That's it. Yes. Oh, much better. Yeah, I mean, that just reinforces my point. Why is Al Gore perceived as a good guy? The reason Al Gore is perceived as a good guy is that he presents himself, and people have accepted him, as there for the public interest. He's, everything he does is for the common good. Oh, by the way, he's becoming rich in the process, but that's not the point. The point is he's trying to make the world a better place. You know, whether it's fighting against, you know, global warming or being a politician or whatever it is, his public persona is, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about you guys. It's about the common good. You know, it's a really interesting phenomenon, right? Uh, why do we have, uh, just as a, uh, it's an aside, but it's related. Um, why do we hate J.P. Morgan? J.P. Morgan was the famous banker who, who had a lot of power in the banking industry in the early part of the 20th century. We hate J.P. Morgan, but we love Bernanke. We love ben I mean, as a culture, we trust Bernanke. Or, or think back to the 90s. Oh, we loved Alan Greenspan. We adored him. We listened to every word he said. But we trust Bernanke. We think he's in it. Why? What, what makes Bernanke a good guy and J.P. Morgan a bad guy? Even though I would argue, and I think if you study economics, J.P. Morgan did a lot more good than Bernanke. All Bernanke and Greenspan do is damage. And J.P. Morgan built industrial America. Yet he's the bad guy. Why? Because he's self-interested. It's obvious. You can't challenge it. And the Federal Reserve Chairman, he's in it for the public good. He gets a small salary, no bonus. So he's the softy, right? He's, he's just, so he is being selfless. And now, if you read Public Choice, and you, you know, you understand that there's a, there's a perverted self-interest there, right? Uh, uh, irrational. I don't think it's real self-interest, but an irrational self-interest, right? But it doesn't matter. He presented and the people buy him as a public servant, right? He's a public servant. We think public servants are good guys. That's why we trust politicians. We claim we don't trust them in surveys and polls, but we do. We let them get away with murder, or at least theft. We don't trust businessmen, because they're in it for themselves. And that goes to Al Gore. Al Gore presents himself. He cares about the environment. Right? And he has a big house that burns more electricity than a whole neighborhood. Right? But nobody, nobody, that doesn't sink in, because they think of Al Gore as this public... 
You know, and we, in spite of our skepticism about politicians, we love them because they, they, they're serving. They're public servants. We like public servants. It's, we don't trust businessmen, even though businessmen do a thousand times more good for the public than any, excuse me, the politicians do, than any politician. I have a second question. There's somebody who hasn't asked. Yeah, in the back. Yes. No. So shouldn't, sure, so isn't Al Gore just pursuing his self-interest and therefore shouldn't he be admired? And my answer is no, he's not pursuing his self-interest and no, as a consequence, he shouldn't be admired. Al Gore is just a Bernie Madoff. He just, we don't see it as obviously, but Al Gore, you know, Bill Clinton's the best example of this. Bill Clinton looks miserable. He doesn't, this guy, these people are not happy. They're not flourishing, successful human beings. I wouldn't change places with Al Gore for all the money on the planet. I think he's a miserable, pathetic human being. <laughs> and I think he knows it. I believe we are particular, we as human beings are a particular type of biological entity. And if you study the biolo this biological entity, which is human, uh, human beings, we need certain things to be happy. We need certain things to be successful, to have self-esteem. And when we reject those things, when we deny those things, we will never be complete human beings. I think that Al Gore rejects those. He denies those. And therefore is not. He's pursuing the facade of self-interest, the pretense of self-interest, but he's not self-interested. He's self-destructive. I think all these guys are self-destructive. I think there are very few people, and you can see this in the world, how many people are really, really happy? That you can really look at and say they live a flourishing, wonderful life, that it just they embrace life. I mean, they're not that many people, unfortunately. They're not, because we teach the opposite. <laughs> And I think, I think some of them, because they're wealthy, because they go after money, does not mean that therefore they are successful. Success is not about the material. It's not about how many dollars you have in a bank. That's not the measure of success. And my measure of success is if you produce them, then I think it is a measure. But if you haven't produced them, it's not a measure of anything. It's a hard argument to make. It's not a question of, I mean, it's a sense in, of consciousness, but it's not a consciousness that, you know, I just think that just like certain foods are good for you and certain foods are poison, right? And it's sometimes hard to tell. I mean, we still have huge debates about what's nutrition and what isn't and what's good for you and what isn't. The science is complicated, right? I think the same thing is true of our spiritual life. Certain actions are good for us. They make for a good life. Certain actions are bad for us. They make for a bad life. I think that the actions that Al Gore takes are bad for him. And the battle is to convince people of the truth of that. In a sense, I believe morality are the doctors of the spirit. Just like nutritionists are the doctors of our material. You know, they tell us what kind of food is good for us, right? Morality should tell us what kind of actions are good for us, what kind of ideas, what kind of values are good for us. And I think that when you engage in bad stuff, it's not that you have some kind of consciousness where you know what's good, but you're doing something evil. You don't even know what's good. It's just that's the impact it's having on your life. It's not good. And it's, you know, it's hard because we've been so conditioned differently in terms of what is good and what is evil. Yes.
So again, let me, let, me, let me do a personal morality and then talk about the politics of it. Well, unless you define it as a moral problem, it never rises. So I don't think people think of it as a moral problem and therefore they never make it, they never think about it. <laughs> so, the, the, and, and this is the problem. So if we teach people, this is what happens in business schools. We teach people that morality is about being selfless and about sacrifice and stakeholders and profit is not moral and all this stuff. And then we tell them to go out and make money, <laughs> right? So we send them out into the world with no moral guidance. I, I, in business ethics class, the only thing I was taught was don't do anything that you don't want to appear the next day in the, in the New York Times, front page of the New York Times. That's not moral guidance, that's just stupid, right? So we give them no moral guidance. So what do people do? And indeed, we give them the opposite moral guidance. What do we tell people? We tell people pragmatism, be a pragmatist. What does pragmatism mean? Pragmatism means short time horizon, do whatever you can get away with. That's what we're teaching people. That's what we teach politicians, that's what we teach our children, and that's what we teach businessmen. And then you have Enron. And again, Enron wasn't a case where they sat down and said, hmm, how can we cheat our shareholders and make lots of money in the process? No, it was a little pragmatic step at a time with a short time horizon where every, cheat, every time they cheated, it was just a little thing and they were gonna make up for it later and slowly it grew into something they couldn't control. That's how most of fraud in business happens. It's very rare that somebody sits down and thinks, oh, how can I cheat people? That doesn't happen that often. So pragmatism is what we teach people. As long as we teach them that, you'll get that kind of behavior. What I'm advocating is for reason. Reason by definition is long term. Reason by definition takes into account the full consequences. And I actually don't think there is a conflict between the short term and the long term. I don't think Bernie Madoff ever enjoyed his money. I mean, he might have had momentary moments where he enjoyed it, right? But I don't think he had spans of months or years where he enjoyed his money, right? Any more than I think that a cocaine addict enjoys his life. He might get a high from the cocaine in a very short period, but it's not like he lives through months of high, right? The high goes away and life sucks because he's a cocaine addict. It's not good for you, it turns out, right? So don't do it. And it, you don't have to think 40 years into the future. Just think a year into the future. Just think two years. Just think of the consequences of your actions. So reason demands long-term thinking. But what I'm arguing for is to think. Just start the process. You know, start the process of thinking. And, and, and particularly in the polit political world today, we're not thinking. We're not taking into account the facts of reality. Nobody in America wants to deal with the economic reality. Nobody. Nobody wants to think about the unfunded liabilities. Nobody is thinking about what, it, what the regulatory state is doing to the economy. Nobody is thinking. It, it's not even short term versus long term. But when you don't think, what is there? There's only short term. Because <laughs> within our perceptual realm, right, what's in our emotional realm, we only relate to the short term. Reason is what demands long term. And when you take reason out of the equation, you get exactly the behavior you described. So we need to emphasize the long term, we need to emphasize time horizons, but it's not like your, it's not like life is good in the short term. Bad economic policy is bad short term and really bad long term. I guess I just don't see it, right? Apple makes 60% profit, I know. Why do I care? Why is it any of my business? I have to make this something. When I go and buy an iPhone, I have to decide, is this worth $300 to me? What relevance is it what it's worth to the other side? I actually know what it's worth to the other side. Less than 300, that's why they're selling it to me. When you, sell, when you go and buy a car, put aside an iPhone, and you're willing to pay in Denmark, cars are expensive, right? <laughs> um, completely market-driven reasons, I understand. <laughs> you pay $40,000 for a car. How much is it worth to the seller? Well, you know exactly how much it's worth to the seller. 
Less than 40,000, that's why they're selling it. All you care about, see, let me turn this into an ethical point. If you believe that the purpose of life is self-sacrifice, if nobility and virtue is selfless, then you look at the other party, you look at Apple and say, wait a minute, if they were moral, they'd be selling this at a loss to me. Those bastards, they're making a profit. They're being selfish and self-interested. Your focus, your whole orientation is on them. What does a self-interested person do? You look at the iPhone or you look at the car and say, is this going to improve my life? Is it worth $300? Yes, you buy it. That's it. You're not interested in what other people are doing. And this is why altruism, selflessness, drives envy. It creates a society of envy. Because if you believe that the ideal is equality, that the ideal is being people being selfless, and there are rich people over there, well, they must be immoral because they're not giving me their money. Morality says I should be equal to them. So how come they're not giving me their money? Your whole orientation is I'm pissed off. I'm upset at those people. I don't like them. I'm envious. I'm jealous. But if you're about self-interest, then your whole focus is about how can I make my life better? If money is important, what's the best job I can find to make as much money as I can? That's it. Oh, this other guy's making a lot of money? Oh, well, that means he's providing a service or a product that people value, and they're making their lives better by making him rich. That's okay. Your whole orientation changes once you change the moral perspective on the problem. And as long as we hold that selflessness is ideal, we will always resent profit. We will always resent the rich. But the fact is that nobody forces you to buy an iPhone. Nobody forces you to take the job at six bucks an hour. Nobody forces you to buy the bread at whatever the bread costs. You make the choice because you would rather have the bread than the $2. Because the bread is more valuable to you. If not, do something else with the $2. Here we have two minutes or two questions? Okay, last question. Yeah. This is the future. And right behind you, you have a world map. <laughs> the, one of the largest areas there, the two powerful economies are right now. This is right there. The other half of the, of the, the map right now. And in Denmark, they are also trying to expand into Finland, buying natural resources. They're very good at it. They, they have uh, like 2,000%. Yeah. And they are buying it slowly. What will happen when they are they going to have a welfare state that is going to stop them? Or are we going to have a less welfare state that is going to make us uh, powerful enough to not be taken? So, you know, so the question is the, the Chinese are buying up the world, you know. <laughs> and uh, and this is is this a real problem? Um Yes and no. Uh, I remember I went to business school in the late 1980s. And the number one problem that we were taught was that the Japanese were buying up the world. I, I mean, I'm serious. You guys forget. But they were buying up the best golf courses in America. They, you remember the Rockefeller Center in New York? The Japanese bought that at the peak. They lost a lot of money on that. <laughs> right? They did. And the free market response was, Great, they're probably overpaying. Somebody's selling. This is cool, right? And what happened to the, the right there, right? They didn't do too well, right? Um, now, China's a, a, a different dynamic, but it's a very similar dynamic. Um, other people buying your natural resources is not a problem. I, I generally don't think natural resources are a problem. There's, ton, there's no shortage of natural resources out there. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they're finding so much natural gas and oil right now in America that's going to make Saudi Arabia look like an insig insignificant, you know, in, in a few years if they were allowed to do this. Um, technology, you know, the only resource that's limited, the only resource that's limited is what? The human mind. There's no limit to resources. We can always figure out how to find more or something else or better. So I don't believe that, the re, that, that there's some 
finite amount of resources and the Chinese are going to buy them all. I just don't think that's going to happen. I also happen to think that the Chinese have got some real big fundamental economic problems that they are still managing to disguise because they've got so, you know, their economy is in such transition that they can still disguise those, but they're huge problems. They will either become, you know, more capitalist because, you know, in a sense of shrinking their public sector, or they are going to have a real financial disaster on their hands, just like Japan did, just like Japan did. Of course, at the same time, looking into the future, the West is in decline. Europe and the United States are in decline. Uh, and I don't see anything stopping that because what is going to have to happen is a real change in ideas. And the fact is that in spite of me loving doing all this and uh, speaking all over the world and trying to get people wild up, it's not enough. <laughs> I'm not that good. Um, the chances of, of, me, of us winning, those of us who believe in capitalism, is not that great. You know, we got to fight, is my view. You can't just pretend, you know, lay down and pretend you're dead. You got to fight. But let's be realistic. The, 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 the number of people amassed against us, both in physical number of people, the amount of money, the amount of intellectual power that they have, the fact that they control the educational institutions from when a kid is this big until they're in college, they got all that. We're struggling against all of that. So you have to, if you were a betting guy, right, you'd have to bet against the for the decline of the West. I happen to think China cannot survive without the West. China's inspired, their model ultimately is a, is a Western model. If the West declines, they will decline too. So I think, I think we need to really focus on saving us. I don't think we should worry about the Chinese. I think we need to make ourselves as free as we can. We need to fight for our own freedom. We need to try to make us as capitalist, as successful, as prosperous as possible. That's enough of a battle, right? That's a, that's, that's, that's a lifetime worth of fighting. Uh, if we can resurrect the, the individualistic spirit that made the West, right? What made the West is Aristotle, it's the Greeks, but it's really a unique period in human history, which is the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is what makes the West special. And the Enlightenment is two ideas coming together. And these ideas are dying. The two ideas are reason, manifest in the scientific revolution of the 18th century, 17th and 18th century, and individualism. It's that merger of individualism and reason that made the West what it is. And that's what's dying. And that's what we need to fight for. And if we can win that fight, then the Chinese don't matter. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Sharon. I've seen you uh, a number of times now, and you're always uh, right on form. So uh, that was a terrific performance, very coherent, very logical, very, very strong arguments that I hope we all, uh, we all feel a little bit more safe in our capitalistic foundation after listening to this. I'm very sorry to have to cut you short because I see everybody was excited, but I did also want us to have the promised glass of wine. And, uh, and the reason I particularly wanted is because I had the uh, my birthday on Saturday in this very room, and uh, I surprisingly overestimated my, my guests' capacity to drink. <laughs> and I have, some, I have some guests with pretty good capacity in, in that uh, area, but there was actually some very good wine left over, so uh, this is the wine we had for my, for my, uh, for my birthday. Uh, it will not always be that quality if you come out for a meeting, so, so you got to come for the speaker as well. But, but for now, thank you very much for coming, and uh, thanks again to Iran. Let's give him one more hand.